uh, it comes from this book, which has just been released this month. And in particular, uh, the content comes from uh, the chapter about unsupervised teacher learning and anomaly detection. So why why this use case? Why anomaly detection? Uh, that's generally speaking, if you speak with any company doing uh, machine learning, then uh, anomaly detection is, uh, is always critical to the business. Uh, and uh, in order to do so, uh, one of the key uh, components of our smart uh, anomaly detection is the feature representation. And that's why we will see this talk how deep learning is actually a uh, very good fit for uh, learning smart representation of your data. So first of all, uh, let's uh, recap. What's an outlier? What is an anomaly? Okay. So often you find confusion, and uh, the two words seem to do mean the same thing. Uh, but actually, uh, uh, an outlier this is a nice uh, definition which I found on the web. Uh, an outlier is a legitimate data point that's uh, far away from the mean or median of a distribution. But uh, it may be unusual, like, I don't know, 9.6 seconds in a 100 meter dash, but still is within the realm of, uh, of the reality. So it's something possible, just something, okay, outstanding, let's say, let's call it outstanding point. But an anomaly is something different. Anomaly is an uh, illegitimate data point that has been generated from a different process that generated the rest of the data. So it's a totally different uh, process that started generating uh, those data points. And uh, we can classify them into three major uh, groups. So when we model, uh, so we got our uh, data set and then we need to start modeling entities. So the simplest case is the point anomaly like the black sheep here, uh, where you know, each row represents one entity. But uh, sometimes that's not enough, and uh, you want to represent some context. So uh, in that case, it, let's suppose we're doing anomaly detection on sales of ice creams, and that kind of spike of ice creams uh, doesn't mean anything, nothing, uh, unless I specify the context, which is if I sell a lot of ice creams in January, there's something wrong. Uh, and then the collective anomaly, is uh, more traditional like fraud detection kind of anomaly. So we have a sequence of events, sequence of uh, data points, and uh, is the whole sequence of things that happen that is suspicious. So what do you do? Take your raw data, you model one of those categories, and then you end up with some uh, uh, feature back. Then it goes through the modeling part. Um, so the typical case is a uh, supervised anomaly detection, which is nothing more than a classification problem. Uh, if you have labels, of course. So if you can label what is an anomaly or not, it's just a binary classification problem. But uh, anomaly detection by definition means that they are very rare. So in your training data set, you're going to find very few cases of positive examples of anomalies by definition. So the data skewness and the lack of counterexamples is your major problem when you try to, uh, to build and train your model using you know, a supervised uh, approach. Well, what can you do? You can do unsupervised, like clustering, but uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with if you've done clustering before, uh, like k-means or similar algorithm. There's one little problem. If your uh, data points uh, are representing a uh, too high dimensional space. So in other words, if your feature vector is too big, let's say even 100 of features, then each point is equally spaced. So the distance between each point, it converges to be the same for each point, no matter what. That's, uh, uh, there's a mathematical proof for that. So that means that when you try to cluster with a lot of features, all the points, you get just random clusters. They make no sense. So what can you do? You can do some semi-supervised, which is a hybrid approach. It's even uh, sometimes you find it in the literature with the name of uh, novelty detection. And uh, what that means is that you need to have a, a train set which you define as normal, and then uh, that's your definition of what is not an anomaly. 
And then whatever is does look like the training set is an anomaly. We'll see that. So with those, you know, with this combination of data modeling and algorithm modeling, uh, there are a bunch of uh, real world applications you find in almost any sector. Uh, if you work in manufacturing, you can use it for hardware tools. In law enforcement, you can use it for you know to reveal criminal activities. Uh, very typical is network systems, find intuitions or malware detection, frauds, of course, is one of the most popular. But sometimes it's not just about finding the bad guy, but for example, if you're doing marketing uh, or you work in a business strategy of your company, then you might want to use an anomaly detection to find uh, to find to spot very profitable customers. So customers that outstep from the rest of your uh, your other clients and they could be very high profitable. Uh, or in healthcare, you generally use for medical diagnosis. But all of this was the major challenge here. I like this, uh, this quote from Andrew NG. Uh, he says that coming up with a feature is always difficult, time consuming, and requires a lot of expert knowledge. So when working application of learnings, we spend a lot of time doing uh, retuning the features. So that's where deep learning comes. Uh, I'm not gonna tell you. I'm not gonna get through uh, theoretical background of deep learning because you know you probably have seen uh, other talks. Uh, I just want to focus on one particular feature: is uh, the hierarchical feature representation of the data. So in that 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 draw makes deep learning deep. The fact that you can take the same data input. And you can just re-represent uh, through different uh, from the stack of uh, hierarchical filters. And why is that important? Is because you can go from pixels, then you can start recognizing edges, and then from edges you can build object parts like a nose, an eye, uh, you know, components of your face, and then you can put them together, and then you get an object, which is the face. And that is structural structural representation because the raw data I start representing in terms of the structures rather than the raw representation itself. So in that particular picture, you can see that you start with a uh, you know with the raw image, and then you can remove the background. Why? It's because you managed to find out what is the structure and what is the background. And all of this happens through this. Uh, uh, signal propagation system, that's the major, uh, the, the core idea behind neural networks. Um, you first try to represent something, then you compute some uh, uh, error, uh, which is your loss function, then you propagate back so that you can uh, tune, you can, that's the learning step. So we're going to see now how uh, those features can be used for anomaly detection with a, a particular configuration of uh, deep neural networks. Which is called autocoders. Autocoders are, uh, you can see, how many of you are already familiar with autocoders? Okay, quite a few. So, autocoders is just imagine to take to take a, a neural network, and then uh, duplicate it and flip it. So, you got one network. And then you have the counterpart, which is exactly the same network but flipped. So why you do that? So essentially, you take one input, goes through those uh, hierarchical filters uh, until you get to the middle point, which in a normal neural network that would be the output layer. But for an autoencoder layer of another network, which is which is just symmetric, and then what this second network tries to do is to reconstruct the original image. So at the end of the day, you obtain an identity function. So get x, get x out. So you might think, why do I do why do I need this? You know, you get the same input, you pass some picture of filter and you get exactly the same input back. Well because of the um, the way we build that topology you see that the number of layers are decreasing in size. So they always get smaller and smaller until you get to the middle, which is called the code. That code is uh, 
is something that contains the most amount of information of the original data. And when you reconstruct the original data back, you only do it from the code. That means you're forcing the algorithm to learn only what matters, only what is important in order to reconstruct the original data. And whatever is not important, reconstruct it, it just get ignored. So how do you use autoencoder for anomaly detection then? That's the algorithm. So whenever you try to do anomaly detection, what you do is first you need to identify a training data set, which you consider to be normal. Normal means that it does not contain anomalies, or if it does, it's a very small uh, percentage of the training set. So uh, imagine you got your, uh, you know, you got a bunch of sheep, and then you say, oh, the sheep all look okay, I like them. So this is going to be my training set. And then I uh, use the autocoder to be able to uh, reconstruct any single sheep in this, uh, uh, this block. And then uh, once you've learned what normal means, means you also learn how to re-represent the sheep uh, through a compression field. And you can use that one, for example, uh, you get one white sheep, and then you just get the same sheep back. But if you try to uh, reconstruct a black sheep, what you get back is a white sheep. Because the training set only observed white sheep, so if you now try to reconstruct a black one, the model is not able to do so. So the model will always reconstruct something that looks similar to what is seen in the training set. And the de-reconstruction error that you get from the original data and what you get as output of the other coder is an indicator, is a score of how much this point is likely to be anomalous. Everything's clear? Yeah. So another use case of other coders, they are very powerful, is uh, features compression. Uh, in that example, uh, what we can do is that uh, we can take the middle, the code, and we can say, you know what, my original data is eight nodes, so it, uh, the dimensional of my data is eight, and uh, I would like to represent every single point in just three, in just three dimensions. It's, it, it, this is something similar to PCA, but PCA is just a linear uh, transformation, while in other coder you can have no linear transformations, much more powerful. And, uh, in that particular example, you see that uh, if you, uh, with a particular configuration of weights that you might learn through the, the training step, then each single input, which is uh, one of the one combination out of the eight numbers, you get out. You know, each input is a binary uh, binary uh, uh, input, and then you get all the com all the combinations. And if you pick one, it's going to get represented with the numbers with those uh, numerical numbers uh, like 0 0.89, 0 0.04, 0 0.08 and only those three numbers are actually able to reconstruct back what was the original input exactly with zero error. That is very powerful and essentially is uh, something that you can use in order to reduce the dimensionality of your data set by uh, preserving the most information possible and after you do so then you can actually apply some uh, shallow machine learning. So you can still do anomaly detection or classification or whatever machine learning algorithm, but first you need to pre-process your data with other coders. Uh, in the examples that I'm gonna show, I'm gonna show you, uh, I've used H2O. So uh, if you're not familiar with H2O, it's a platform for doing machine learning. And uh, it's a lot, it's pretty much uh, production oriented, so it allows you to do prototyping, but then uh, the, the nice thing is that you can switch from, you can move from a, a dev environment to a production environment with almost uh, very little cost. And we're going to see, uh, so I have two examples that I prepared, it's actually come from the book, but uh, we don't have time, I think, to do uh, both of them, people are hungry, so and we only got one. Right. Uh, I chose the uh, ECG, the electrocardiogram, post detection use case because it 
because it's a combination of both feature compression and uh, novelty traction. So let's see. So uh, I will I'll, I'll skip a few details. I will just focus on the on the concept. So I'll, let, let me zoom. Okay. So first thing you do is you, you import the H2O like a library, like a module, and then you, when you do in it, you start an H2O cluster on your machine. So unless you have some uh, cluster already set up, you, if you do just log in it, it's gonna start the local environment in your laptop. Then you can start working with it. So uh, H2O already made public uh, a data set, the data set for the electrocardiogram. So we're just going to use the same one. Um, if you do it on shape, uh, we get the size of the matrix. It's essentially, it's a very small data set just for proof of concept. It's around 23, no, around, it is 23 rows and uh, 210 columns. And what those columns represent is a particular sample in time of a piece of signal on an electrocardiogram that we're going to visualize. So if we visualize the data, that's how it looks like. Uh, you got a bunch of signals, okay? And uh, you can see that all of the, most of the signals are pretty much of the same shape. They follow the same shape. They, there's an offset, so they are delayed from each other. Uh, but more or less, they follow the same structure, is it? So, but there are the last three, which is the 21, 22, and 23, which correspond to those signals over here. So it's clear that those three signals are anomalous. So the goal is to train an audio caller. Uh, and automatically find out that those three signals on there they don't follow the you know the normal path. How do we do that? Um, okay, this is just a bunch of uh, utils or plots. That's how you build a model and out encoder in H2O. All you have to do is do an import, set a seed, or uh, because there's a, a race condition. In uh, training the deep learning uh, network is done in a multi threading. So, because of race conditions, you may get uh, different results based on the seed. And the seed is uh, because of the whole while, it's an algorithm for doing uh, multi threading uh, uh, learning of deep, uh, deep neural networks. Anyway, this is just an implementation detail. Uh, what you do is to create this class, and you need to specify a few uh, parameters. Can you read that? Try and zoom. Better? Okay. So, you need to specify what activation function you want to use. And this is a, a hyperbolic tangent function. So, it, it, it looks like a sigmoid function, but it goes from, uh, uh, so the, the domain of the function is actually between minus infinity and you know, whatever real number, and then the output is between minus one and one. So uh, it's just you know an activation function like a sigmoid or uh, uh, rectified here uh, unit. The hidden is an array that specifies the size of each uh, layer in your network. And uh, it's very important that we keep it symmetric. I'm not gonna tell you why this book. This is too much details, but uh, it's important. It has to be the same size. So you go from 210, uh, you go down to 50, and then those 50 nodes feed the next layer of 20, and then in the middle you get two, and then from two you are able to reconstruct back the original signal. That means you can represent any single signal with only two numbers. It's amazing, isn't it? So let's see how that works. You do the train. Okay, uh, and then I've done some uh, plot users. It's going to show me uh, each single point, each single signal on a two-dimensional space. Look at that. So each point is one signal. Okay, and they all parts of these two axes. 
and then the color is represent the reconstruction error. So if red means zero, zero means no anomaly. It just has been reconstructed perfectly. If that color is higher than zero, means there was something wrong in the reconstruction. And we can see that those three signals, which is 20, 21, and 22, they got a higher reconstruction error. Let's try to visualize it in a more uh, uh, clear way. So, if you remember the previous picture, there were a few signals, and then there were three of them just, you know, going on their own path. They were not following the rest of the signals. This is the, the reconstructed version. So you get some uh, weird signal. You try to reconstruct through an audio encoder which has been trained on uh, normal signals. And what happens is that all of them look the same. Because this is the normalization. And that means that uh, that is the shape of the signal if it was uh, an anomaly. If that was normal, that would be the signal. But because it's, a, it's, a, it's not normal, but it's an anomaly, you're going to see a very high reconstruction error because that doesn't look like the one we've seen before. So, if we just try to plot, uh, you know, all the reconstruction errors, we can see that the first 20 got almost zero and then the last three is got very high score. And uh, if you put a cutoff point here, essentially you've done an anomaly infection. Now, uh, that is the normal detection approach. And I want to show you how we can do something a little bit more advanced, very quickly. Uh, do you remember when we visualized uh, each single signal on two-dimensional spaces? I can do the same uh, again using different uh, seed. If I use different seed, I'm going to get another two-dimensional representation. So we defined a few seeds, and then I did the training many times. So at the end, what happens is that that is another, yet another representation of the same data, but they just get co-located differently. This is just one of the many two-dimensional representations. They all contain the same amount of information. And then if I change seed again, I get this. And then I do it again, and I get this. Then I do it again, again, again. So every single time I change a seed, what happens, I get the points get redistributed. But, have you noticed that those two guys here, they always end up very close to each other. So, look at this. 21 and 22, very close to each other. 21 and 22, very close to each other. 21 and 22, okay, that will be, but they're not too far from each other. And again here, you see? So, that is a very important property. It's, you do it unsupervised learning. You're not feeding your data, you don't have labels. You're just saying that your data contains some anomalies. And uh, this algorithm is able to first detect what is an anomaly, and secondly, classify, group together similar anomalies. So you will get that 21 and 22, uh, they represent one type of anomaly, while 20 is an anomaly, but it's a different type. And all of these get for free. You don't need to label your data set. And that is, in my opinion, the real power of uh, these neural networks. So you see, again, that are all good representation of the same data set. And uh, from that, uh, you can apply a lot of uh, other algorithms on top of it. So you can either use autoencoder as the anomaly model, or you can use the autoencoder as a pre-processing. Step, and then you can do whatever you want because now you represent your data with a much smaller dimensional space, so you can do faster now, for example. Let's switch back to the presentation. Uh, if you are interested, you're going to find this on GitHub, so it's public. You're also going to find another uh, example, similar one using uh, digit uh, anomaly recognition. But uh, because it's late and we're all angry, let's summarize. So what we've seen in this talk was, first, firstly, we listed a few real-world applications of uh, how you can use anomaly detection. 
Then we cover a few techniques that you find in the literature with their limitations. And then we propose this uh, uh, deep neural network system that actually need to solve, to remove those limitations. And uh, in particular, we propose those two semi-supervised approaches, one based on model detection and the other one based on uh, feature compression. If you are really interested in this topic, in this uh, research area, there's a lot going on. If you really want to go deeper, you will find uh, in, in this book that's been you know, published, you're going to find a lot of stuff about advanced modeling, like denoising other folders, contracting other folders, sparse other folders, variation other folders, stack other folders. There's all different variants of uh, the basic idea of, uh, of the other folder but they give you a uh, much higher performance. And uh, also, if you're interested on uh, how to build uh, a production-ready um, anomaly detection system, you have to be careful on, uh, because it's different from uh, standard uh, classification problems. So there are a few techniques that are really particular just for uh, the anomaly detection. And uh, all of this is called the book. And I uh, managed to get this 30% uh, discount for anyone uh, who's interested from the community. So you'll find this on the on the website uh, as well. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? <laughs> I think I have another question. But, uh, I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more. Okay. Well, if you tell us a bit more about the stacked autoencoders, I haven't heard about that before. So, stacked autoencoders means that, uh, uh, for example, it's used for initialization purposes. So, stacked autoencoder means that you, take, you build one autoencoder. Let's have a picture here. Yeah, like this. You build this autoencoder, okay? And then, after you train, you only take this output. And then uh, from this point on, you start building another autoencoder. And then uh, it's a recursive way of uh, training autoencoders. Uh, that means that the first one is going to give you this set of weights. So when you train on a neural network, what you're doing is just finding the best uh, metrics of weights. So we first find the weights here, then you take all the, 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 the output of the first layer, and that becomes the input layer of another autoencoder. Then you train it, and then you go to the first layer of this second autoencoders, and the first layer of the second autoencoders becomes the input layer of the third one, and so on. So you, you can, instead of having just one topology, like 4, 3, 2, you can have 4, 3, 2 for the first layer, and then you can build another one, which is, I don't know, 3. Okay, here you don't have so much space because it's only 3, but let's suppose it was 30, 30, 20, then you would take the output after training here, which is 30 nodes, and then he might go through another network, which is 15, 10. Okay? And then you, you train it, and then you take the output at 15, and that might go into a different network, and so on. And by doing so, you essentially uh, decrease the probability of overfitting. So it could become much more robust. Yeah. Great, thanks. So then it's hard to explain without seeing it. No, I've, uh, got it, I've got it. I've got yeah. it. It's a training regime, right? So that's a way to minimize exactly what you're looking for right there. Yeah. Which is generally neural networks aren't aiming at what you're aiming for unless you do what you're talking about there. Yeah. So what I think in the previous talk, uh, she said something very important that uh, one of the major problems with uh, neural networks is that they get to fit a lot. So they, especially for the training set, contains biases. So from an engineering point of view, if you really want to use those algorithm, algorithms in production, you have to be very careful on regularization. But regularization is not like last so linked regression. It's not that easy. It's something a little bit more complicated. For example, for that particular type of networks, you could use the stack of encoders, or you can use the noise, uh, the noising of encoders. Uh, there are a bunch of techniques, and uh, if you don't do so, uh, I don't. I, I strongly do not recommend to use those in production. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I got no? shot. Uh, I was wondering, I mean, uh, so I was wondering, uh, you were explaining that uh, you were giving an example of uh, uh, essentially a time series. So there is a uh, repeating signal, a particular shared in time in this uh, heartbeat signal, right? Uh, so uh, for this, uh, I would assume one can also use the uh, recurrent neural network. Yes. Is it possible to actually combine the recurrent neural network with our encoders, or is it too complicated? That's a very good question, and, as I, and actually, when you do uh, time series anomaly detection, uh, recurrent neural networks are more uh, uh, suitable, Jeremy. Uh, so the way that would work is that, uh, general, generally, when you're working with time series anomaly detection, you build a regression system, like a you know, forecast model. So you try to predict what's going to be next, then you compare so what you, then you compare what you measure today with what has been predicted, and then based on the difference between what the model predicted on today and what I can measure today, you do the normal detection, which is the same concept. You, know, you, you look at the uh, reconstruction error. In that case, you look at the uh, absolute error between what you predicted and what you measure. Uh, but uh, it's uh, conceptually, they do different things. Uh, because the LSTM is a stateful network, okay? So you need to feed the data in a certain order, and uh, if you don't have a long history, you won't work it, right? I mean, you need to train with long histories because uh, the model needs to be able to memorize things and reuse it in the future. While other coders, um, they delegate uh, this, the temporal sequence so you encapsulate the temporal order in the vector representation. So in that case, we fix on 220 samples. So our window is, okay, give me the, the last 220 uh, measurements, and then based just on this window, I'm gonna tell you if that window is anomalous or not. Which LSTF, you have an theoretically unbounded history you know, past. You can take the whole history of your data set between the first uh, point in signal up to, I don't know, years of, uh, of the history, and then you will always tell you uh, what's going to be next. Both of them are uh, very powerful techniques. Yeah. Um, you said that you started with uh, 50, 50 notes in the, in the first layer, and you ended up in the with the just you know, right? Yes, yeah, so the network so looks like this. You managed like this to reduce the, the information just to two numbers? Yeah. That's the, that's the, but uh, is there a parallelism uh, with uh, maybe the um, ray transformation of the signals so that uh, you can interpret your signal as having two uh, frequencies, you can represent every signal with that's the amplitude of the your two frequencies when you can classify uh, the signals based on the Fourier transformation of time. So what you're saying is that I have a signal, I know there are two major frequencies, so I'm just gonna represent uh, each signal with the value of uh, you know those two frequencies. So you're doing feature learning here. So you put in your domain knowledge, and then you try to do smart representation of the data, and then you apply normal detection, which you, which works. Okay, you can do I don't know uh, Fourier transformation, then inverse Fourier transformation, then you can apply the same logic. So yes, you can do that, but that that uh, assumes that you know what the data looks like because you know what the frequencies are, and you know if you're doing some handcrafting of the features, all the coders they figure it out. We need to worry about. So, if your signals really are could be represented with just two frequencies, the model will figure it out, and that's the, the real power of uh, neural networks. I mean, theoretically, it should figure it out. Then, in practice, in practice, that happens only in five percent of cases. Then, the other ninety-five will need to stay in uh, some hand tuning of the network. But yeah, if you manage to <laughs> to do the right modeling, then it will happen.
Uh, how do you come to this architecture? Do you have a rule of thumb where to start? Yeah. Right, so this is another preview. Uh, is a, I wrote that in the, essentially, when you build a production rate system, it's the outline. So that chapter, essentially, now in that chapter here, uh, I haven't covered, but uh, I wrote down uh, a list of rule of thumbs, which I don't have it now in the presentation, but essentially there are some rules. Uh, when you build an auto coders, for example, if your data is uh, uh, numerical, you have to use a few activation functions. But if your data is a binary or is different nature, you should use different uh, different functions. And also the the number of layers is actually does mean something, right? It's not it's not random. You see that, okay? You having how many layers here? See. First layer is edges, then from edges you can build uh, parts of the face, and then composing parts of the face you get back the, the face, okay? So, at the core wouldn't have any benefit. If I, only, if I would cut here, I would only get noses and eyes, okay? So I wouldn't be able to reconstruct the face. So, the number of layers is the, probably the easiest thing to, uh, to guess, because it does have some intuition, okay? Uh, how many nodes do you have here? This is where uh, deep learning specialists uh, uh, get paid a lot of money. You know, they are very high on demand because those are the people that actually got some experience, so they got some gut feeling, and they can tell you, oh, I think here you should really use those uh, real numbers. There's no, uh, I don't think this is still an open uh, issue, so you can do a brute force when you try to tune everything, you can do something a little bit, a little bit more smarter. Uh, remember, back in time, there used to be the genetic algorithms for uh, tuning neural networks. Now they will be outdated. Uh, there are other techniques. Then uh, this is the engineering approach. Just try out, you know, see what works better. But uh, uh, you know, let's just start thinking. Oh, let's focus your brain, and then how the brain would work. You might find some inspiration. Or define uh, why this should be four, this should be three. Uh, you know, we need to find inspiration from the nature. It's a really open question. Okay. But uh, there are rule of thumbs. Okay. But, uh, you'll find a book. I can't tell you everything, otherwise, I'm not going to sell it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry, I gave you the microphone. <laughs> okay. Way to, is there a way to explore actually fusions that are uh, recognized by the Arcane Codex? What do you mean by different layers? Like, we oh, have yeah. 50, 50 neurons, and then 20, and then 2, let's say also 4 and 2, but for four dimensional space, it's kind of hard to explore uh, fusions that are recognized and uh, to understand what's really so how can we do that? Generally, the way it all works is that you create a matrix, a grid, where you have you know, layer 1, layer 2, layer 3, layer 4, then you have uh, all the neurons on each layer. Let's suppose that uh, you have the same number of neurons, just for simplicity. So you have a, uh, a matrix, okay? Then each single time you have one input feature, you're going to uh, color in black or white, based on whether that neuron flags or not. Now, if it fires, you set the threshold, say, okay, if the activation value of that particular neuron is higher than that threshold, I'm going to color it in white, otherwise I'm going to color it in black. Or you can use some gray scale. And then, uh, by doing so, essentially, you get one input after training, get one input, and then you start visualizing this map, and then you can see that when, uh, I don't know, pictures of a uh, woman, for example, every single time you feed the algorithm with pictures of women, you're going to see the same neurons uh, fire, you know, on the screen. And then uh, if you start feeding with pictures of, I don't know, cars, uh, vehicles, you're going to see different uh, areas of this map to start, you know, widening. 
And uh, that is exactly how the brain works, you know. This is the activation places in the network that should, should you know, simulate the way that your brain activates uh, the, the neurons. Uh, that's that's very good way, actually, to do. So you take a group of uh, data and say, oh, let's see what are the neurons that get activated. And this is a, a very useful way for doing troubleshooting. If you see that your network is not behaving as you expected, that's something you want to try out. You start feeding with a, a bunch of data points that uh, you know they are very similar to each other, and then you expect the same places, uh, the same activations to happen. If that doesn't happen, means your uh, network it, it just learns some random structure. Okay, then you need to regularize. But if you see consistency in the activations, means that your your network actually got smarter. So it's a good sign. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I mean, uh, so uh, we often get faced with really, really imbalanced data sets, right? And I'm wondering if uh, anomaly detection is really the way out in really imbalanced data sets. Like you make a case for broad, broad is one in a million transactions, for example. So you have a lot of lots of data about normal transactions, almost not about the broad. Is not on the section the way to the way to go there? So, uh, can you can you reformulate? So, the, if you have a lot of data, yes, yeah, so the very imbalanced data sets. Right? So you've, got, you've got two categories, for example, for the non fraud fraud is ninety nine point nine nine percent not going to be there. <laughs> it's only going to be there in tiny tiny few cases. Is this sort of anomaly detection the right way to go with really really imbalanced data sets? Yeah. So all the wrote down here is that if you're doing supervised learning, then you have the problem with the uh, class uh, you know, uh, uh, imbalances. So if it's not balanced, then it doesn't work. Because you only learn how to represent one class. But the other class doesn't count, you know, in the in your metric, you know, training metric. So that approach doesn't look into the labels at all. It's a, it's a, I can't say it's a Unsupervised because uh, it has the assumption that the training set contains only a small uh, portion of anomalies, but the, the most of them are normal. So that that's why I don't call it unsupervised. But it is unsupervised because it's not that is not using any label. Uh, so yes, that's the only way to go in that case, and that's why supervised approaches fail. In the node detection, for exactly for this reason. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, I mean, uh, we're gonna stay here tonight, so we're gonna always uh, talk later. Uh, I'm free everyone now, so you can go and eat some food. Uh, but before to do that, let's, uh, let's say thank you to our uh, event sponsor, Think Big. That make this event happening, and also uh, our organizing team, our organizer at that table. Let, 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 let's give them a. There are about ten people in the organization staff, and uh, all the events that we organize is uh, thank you the whole uh, crew. So thanks again, and uh, enjoy the evening.